Good morning, everybody, or uh, good evening, uh, Claire, and um, this um, welcome to the seminar, the webinar organized by the Eurocide European Land Conservation Network Working Group on Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Climate. Nature means business. And um, our three speakers, um, who are all farmers from a farming, uh, from farming background, uh, will um, take turns um, to discuss what this means in terms of arable farming, in terms of livestock farming, and what economic uh, theory, economic conclusions can be drawn from all this. And I think the topic uh, that working with nature, not against it, uh, is good for farm business, is good for farm accounts. Uh, because you get uh, better health of your soils and your uh, predator pest ratio is better and you, make, you get better yields and better quality of produce and at the same time you lower your inputs uh, is a very appropriate and important message, particularly today uh, with the war in Ukraine uh, disturbing world markets for agricultural produce with uh, energy prices and fertilizer prices and in fact chemical prices in general exploding this message is more opportune than ever. Uh, it's very clearly an important message, and now is the moment. And in fact, I think the great question to be really is uh, not even so much whether nature does mean business, because our speakers will prove that, but I think the really big question now is how to get this message across to the people that can use it, other farmers and everybody involved in the agricultural industry, um, so that um, uh, this, this is taken up and applied widely. But so that is a, a more of an overarching question and, and worth thinking about. But without further ado, I, I think I give the floor to uh, our first speaker, uh, Martin. Um, Martin, it's over to you now. Okay, thank you and good morning. I'll just share my screen. And hopefully you can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good, great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, on, just move that bar. So I've got a bar in the middle of my screen. I can't see. Uh... I will make it work. So. Uh... Nature friendly farming, improving uh, your bottom line and the biodiversity on your farms. So my name is Martin Lyons. Uh, I used to call myself an arable farmer uh, in Cambridgeshire, but I'm more of a mixed farmer and work. You know, I farm nature and and produce goods. Uh, we work with a, with the soil, the environment, um, and reintroducing livestock into my cropping system to build fertility and, and unique nature's assets. So we're based on 165 hectares, uh, family-based farm. I'm the third generation of our family to be farming this area. We also rent uh, other land, uh, contract farm for other farmers and do additional contracting work. So we're trying to work with a wide range of other farmers and we also work with conservationists delivering their environmental habitats and land management where, where, they, where I can. So like many farms, our farm has changed tremendously over the last 80 years. When my grandfather was here, the steam engines had left, the horse and carts were still here, and the little grey fergies and little tractors come. And the farmers back then, they felt and touched the soil. They were connected to the environment and to the landscape. And as we've moved forward into more modern machinery, we've sealed ourselves in cabs with air conditioning and many farm managers now don't actually do much farming as sit in an office. And we've disconnected ourselves from that landscape and that environment and working with it. So our farm, we were encouraged post-war to remove many of the hedgerows, fill in ditches and focus on productivity and feeding the world and increasing output. And as we move forward, our thinking has greatly changed in what we do. So the focus, as I said, in the past was to produce as much as possible uh, without any con you know, consequences to the environment. That wasn't to worry about. It was just maximum output, much input as possible, using lots of science and uh, machinery and inputs. But, but actually more I've understood and, and get a focus around my environment, my natural capital that I can use, 
and, and have my ba my farm based on on, on environmental uh, assets. My focus has now changed to produce as much as possible for the best margin for all the goods and services the public wants. We obviously got to produce food, but we also have to deliver cleaner air, biodiversity recovery, and in, in many places, public access and water management. So our focus changes within our businesses and we can deliver what we want from, to, for society, but also the best for my bottom line within my business. So as I said, we use quite a bit of uh, data and, and modern uh, technology. So we've scanned all our fields to understand the productivity of every part of the field. We recognize some parts of the field are not as productive as others. So the images on the left-hand side in the center, you've got all the different oranges and yellows, and they're all the different soil contexts within, a, within one field. And we can start to understand that some bits of the field are productive, some aren't. The middle images on the great green ones with the different percentages on, we can adjust our seed rates. So where we have good soil, we can reduce inputs. And where we have poor soil, we may want to increase seed rates to get a better establishment. And the picture directly on the left with the different oranges and greens in, uh, we can vary our inputs. So where we do have a deficient area, where we've not looked after the soil, this is the only place we need to put any fertilizer. So we can farm within less than half hectare blocks, understanding the productivity of each piece and be really careful about where we need to invest or, or deliver artificial inputs or where we're getting a more balanced uh, soil structure. And the two images on the, my right-hand side, the greens and the red edges, they're our yield maps. And that's one of the best things in an arable farm that gives you the understanding of the differences within a field. And the red, the green is usually where we're making best profit and the red is usually at a loss because they're unproductive, they're the awkward headlands, the shaded sides. So what we managed to do across our farm is look at those different areas, the unproductive, the less profitable bits to farm, what else can we do? And within the, within the UK, we can get funding from the public, uh, from, the, from governments to deliver environmental uh, improvements of wildflowers and birdseed mixes and other areas. So we can target those pieces within the landscape to make the middle of the field and the most productive bits the most profitable, but also deliver environmental improvements. And over the last five or six, probably 10 years, I've really come to understand that the more we have a balance with nature across our farm landscape, the more productive and profitable I've become. So in those areas we've taken out of production because of, they were a wet area or a shaded side of a field, we're delivering various different habitats through government funded schemes that to deliver biodiversity recovery. So here we've got an example of a bird seed mix. Uh, we've already uh, identified the different birds we have on our farm and what is missing. And we can deliver different habitats. So we deliver a seed source for the winter, always have a pollinating element in because many young birds want an insect before they want a seed. And we can target them across our farm, having an in interconnected joined up landscape with productive farming and nature working hand in hand. Alongside many of our water courses and a ribbon running through our farm, we're doing these flower margins and mixes, and that buffers our water courses, delivers an interconnected landscape. But also what we have found is the, as we've increased pollinators homes on our farm, our yields have gone up. We have more uh, in pollinated crops and more a yield benefit. We also have found that the pests or the predatory pests that live in these margins are now eating my aphids. We've, for the last be nine years this spring, we've no longer needed to use insecticides because we have enough home across our landscape to deliver predatory insects. So it's about this fair balance between working with nature and, and having that as an asset on our farm. So one of the trials we were in, involved in last year um, I really enjoy having scientists on farm and other people to really put science and some background to what, the, what this is. So we grew some spring beans. Uh, we normally have a pest, a brooklid beetle that will uh, chew the beans, uh, leaves, and then get into the beans when we come to harvest them. So we're farm A on these charts. So on the left-hand side, you, you can see we had up to 6% and 11% damage. Field farm B, was a, a, a farm that does some environmental measures, but it still does some um, 
insecticide spraying and farm C uh, was a conventional all input farm. And actually what we found is on our farm and, and what the, the trial was finding, we had less pest damage and we were not using insecticides um, and we we're having a better yield benefit and less harm. And you'll see the images on the right hand side through their sweep nets. We had to need two thirds more beneficiaries within our whole landscape and within my crop as well as compared with others. And the others had more pest species. And the more we understand this relationship between nature and biodiversity and productive farming, the more the relationship works in my favor and in my business bottom line. Many years ago, this is how we used to cultivate our soil. We were getting bigger and bigger machinery, moving more and more soil. <clears throat> and we were investing really large lumps of uh, capital money in, in buying, this, uh, buying the machinery. And what we actually found, the more we did, the more soil we moved, we noticed that the soil degraded more and more, became wetter, became tougher to move. So actually what we did is, is worked a plan to get, get out of the soil stop that investment, stop causing the harm that the big machinery was doing to our soil. And we moved into cover crops. So we now use root, uh, different root structures from different plants to structure my soil and work with the biodiversity within the soil and, and the worms. So we have nature's way of structuring our soil, building fertility. A lot of these cover crops would have many legumes in. Uh, so that's building fertility, uh, draw up different phosphates and potashes, building organic matter to go back into the soil. So it makes our soil more, more structured and productive, keeping our soil covered. So when we have really dry periods, the ground's not uh, losing its moisture as much. And it's also holding more photosynthesis and, and capturing more carbon, which in, in today's world is a real positive thing. So for all our farm fields now and across our farm, we no longer do any cultivation. Soon after harvest, we'll go and place a cover crop in uh, and, and keep a living root growing and depend on when the next time we'll plant the next crop, whether that's an autumn or a spring. We can adjust those seed mixes to deliver real benefit to our soil. So this, it's been huge beneficiaries to our, our system, moving less soil. You'll see a plow based system was costing us 170 pounds per hectare and moving to zero till we're down to 50 pounds a hectare and a massive saving on fuel. So all that machinery and investment in, in kit we had, we can liquidize that and leave, need less top money tied up into machinery. So we have less exposure uh, to, to that increased prices of technology and machinery. And those cover crops gave us multiple other benefits uh, and it's really improving our soil structure and our ability to farming in a really changing climate. We had a conversation at the beginning of this morning. We are seeing our weather patterns change from extreme dry to extreme wet and focusing on soil health and that natural asset we have really makes our business more uh, productive and profitable. So we've gone away from drilling on bare soil wherever possible. Now we're drilling into green covers and this drill has a crimp roller on the front so we can lay down the cover keep the soil protected and covered and drill straight into it. And for my, you know, for my younger days and particularly my father's time, that was a completely different concept to what we currently do now. Um, they like nice street, straight drilled lines, bare soil. Now we're into uh, keep, keeping the soil covered, working, working with that environmental thing. And because we run on roots now, we're not compacting the soil. If you go out onto a field that's been cultivated and walk across it, your footprints stay in the soil. You walk across a, a living mat, your footprints don't squash the soil. We, as, as farmers, have poor soil compaction and, and degradation, and we can actually farm in a way that improves it. One of the other multiple benefits of um, changing our system and having cover crops is welcoming livestock back into the farm. And fertilizer cut out the bum is far better than out of a bag. And we really massively cut our artificial fertilizer use. Um, this year we've, uh, we've used less than half than we did uh, two years ago. And as we're going along and building our soil health up, it is really cutting our artificial fertilizer need down. And my hope within the next couple of years that we will remove it almost completely. And using natural fertility building periods and using that, that that's free, that's given to us by nature, 
and introducing more livestock. We've also planted some herbal lays this year, and I'm hoping to bring cattle back into the system as well. So we have a mixture of different livestock. These sheep aren't my sheep. I don't really like sheep. They tend to either want to run away or die. But I've got a local young uh, shepherd who's building his business up. I can give him access to, to grazing. We can get, it gives us a small rent, which is another income coming into the farm. But also it gives me a fertility period, period as well. So we do a lot of uh, data collection to, to back up what we're seeing within our fields. Uh, we scan, we use satellite imagery to look at, assess the crop, nitrogen need. We do tissue analysis and soil analysis. And this spring we were sampling some of our fields and we're finding we have 230 kilos a hectare of nitrogen locked up in our soil and within our crop. So that crop has needed no artificial fertilizer this year. And I expect to get an equal amount of yield to my near neighbors who are using a full input system buying fertilizer at today's price at a thousand pounds a ton. So by farming in a different way and working with the natural, more natural processes using manures, cover crops, fertility building, you can actually move away from those most, uh, most expensive inputs and actually the journey for net zero, anything fossil fuel based uh, will need to be moved away. So we're actually clearly seeing real financial benefits by changing our system. And much of that is never normally seen, but by having the data collected for us, we actually can put pounds and pence to it. And also we, we do tissue analysis. So we get to go and take samples out of the crop. And you can clearly, this crop has had no fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, and we're clearly in the normal and high range. But because we've got that organic material in the ground and that fertility built up, some of the trace elements are creeping a bit low. So we have been able to go in and, and treat uh, with, a liquid, with, a, with a trace element spray just to bring those up. But we're now no longer needing to use our machinery so much. So there's less wear and tear, less hours. We've actually managed to remove a lot of our machinery and we share what we do with more neighbors. And it's becoming more cost effective to bring a contract, another contractor in to do small areas than us have a whole machine and leave it parked up for much of the year. So it's really about finding that balance going forward of working with neighbors, sharing capital uh, costs and machinery, uh, sharing livestock. So we all get multiple benefits out of it. So for me, farming is always about delivering now, it's about delivering habitats all year round for pollinators, creepy crawlies, building on soil health, building nature and using it as a natural asset that's given to us free. We're one of the few industries that get free gifts from nature and we use it and harness it in a, in a productive, profitable way that makes our farm far more sustainable, far more profitable than we ever did were before. And actually far more enjoyable because you have a lovely landscape to enjoy. We have more people within the landscape because we have a grazier coming on and it makes a more uh, enjoyable business. There is still challenges sometimes through cash flow and through input prices and commodity prices moving about, but we're far better positioned now than we were five, six years ago. So that's me finished. Uh, I belong to the Nature Friendly Farming Network, uh, which is a network across farmers, bringing farmers together to champion a way that nature means business. We farm in ways that work with nature, profitability and, and productivity. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Martin. That was very eloquent. Um, I have, there's a question, and I think it might not be a bad idea to take it now because it's a question, it's about a technical detail, so it might be a good idea to take it now. It's a question from Christine. Uh, Christine, do you want to uh, ask it yourself? Um, in that case, unmute yourself, or I, do you want me to ask it for you? Yeah, <laughs> well, I wanted, to, I would like to know what kind of um, software or app you uh, used for the pasture or yield mapping you showed in one of the first slides. Um, yeah, so our, our combine has a yield map monitor built into it. So that collects the data of yield, moisture, and a load of other stuff. And we run with a company called Soil, S-O-Y-L, and they, they stack the data for us. So we can have the yield map mapping data in there. We have soil nutrition, soil uh, variety, you know, different textures. 
Also, they stack in there the satellite imagery that comes past every week or fortnight of the crop biomass in different things. And there's many other companies that are offering a similar service of uh, sort of stacking the data we collect through our machinery alongside satellite imagery and soil health. So we can understand the productivity of a, of a whole field and which bits we can learn the most out of and doing different things from. Would you put the link um, maybe in the chat of yep. this company? That was nice. Thanks. Good. There's a second question that's come up from Barbara, and this is a much more general question, actually, and, and a very important one. And I think I'll wait with taking that one uh, because it will also, would also apply to Claire, actually. So we'll keep the, this one as the first question for the discussion after the presentations. So now I'll pass the floor to Claire. Claire, could you share your screen? Yes, sure. Terrific, thank you. Can you all see that? Um, now, my story's uh, a little bit different. Um, I yeah. actually... Could you wait? We, we can't see it yet. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, sorry. No, would you try again? Um, yeah. It probably takes a while from it to travel from Australia to, to Europe. <laughs> Even the speed me... of light. Otherwise, we might take uh, Barbara's question while you get yourself set up. Um, to yeah, keep the... Sorry. Yeah. Screen. Uh, where am I? Yeah. Um, so but maybe while we get this sorted out, Barbara, maybe you put your question to Martin. Uh, um, or do you want me to read it out for you? No, I can. I can. Uh, I can read it out. <laughs> so I was just wondering. You cannot just decide from one day to the other day to work this completely different way, right? Uh, I think it, it takes some years to, to be able to rely on your soil and to rely on nature to help you work in this nature-based way. So as well, I was wondering how long does it take to trans transform your farm uh, to this new way of working? I, I think it, for me, it depends on how degraded your farm was in the first place. Uh, if uh, for many farms in East Anglia, they have very few hedges. They mow all the margins at the end of a harvest. They have very little natural capital left on their landscape. Uh, and, and it has got to be a building process. Uh, and I would say most farms within three to five years, by putting habitat back in place, various other things, building soil health, then you can start take, within three, you know, three years, you can start be confidently winding down but you can always map it with the data and you can see what they are. But so most of our flower margins, you, you establish them one year, you mow the heck out of them the second year to get them really established well. And by the third year, they're really starting to deliver that biodiversity. And then you're building that life cycle of uh, predatory insects and pollinators on your farm. So by year four and five, you can really rely on that as an asset. Okay, thank you. So you, gra you gradually go to this nature-based way uh, and you really monitor your 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 land yeah uh, you, I, if you did it overnight and stopped you know from one system to the other the, the soil doesn't you know, hasn't got the asset that you want so you've got to build it in uh, and the same as building it in your business model uh, and through your transition within your you know your, your farming system and build that into it so i would say yeah Within a plan, I, I planned, if I take new farms on now as a contractor, I have a three or five year plan, depending on how degraded that farm is when I start. Okay, thank you. Good, and I think we're ready now to... Um, you you to can see all this now. Um, we're all set. <laughs> yeah, looks like it. Off you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, I just wanted to say, um, unlike Chris, I love sheep. <laughs> But um, uh, this is a little bit of a different story. This is a story of how uh, I uh, put a covenant on uh, a third of our property, Wamagama Station. 
So uh, my family, uh, my parents bought Wamagama Station in uh, 1965, and uh, it is uh, uh, six and a half thousand acres. And uh, I took it over uh, 10 years ago after my mother died. And these are just photos that you'll see going through um, from some of our covenant country and just some of our country. So not long after I'd taken the property over, I had a visit um, from two uh, ecologists from the Nature Conservation Trust. And they said, uh, we want to put a covenant in perpetuity over a third of your property. So uh, this is quite a big ask. Uh, the reason being this country is critically endangered grassy box woodland of which there's only 5% uh, left in Southern Australia. So when Australia was under uh, Aboriginal stewardship, they used to cool burn the country. Um, so the, the trees were in um, copses rather than um, in, in um, forest country. And um, most of our uh, national parks um, are forest. Anyway, my husband uh, had conniptions uh, when he heard about this and, uh, you know, felt that he was, uh, that we were giving away um, a third of the property. So we decided to do um, a valuation um, pre-covenant um, and potentially um, post-covenant. And what we found was that um, a covenant really wouldn't take much off um, the value of the property because it was pretty low carrying capacity country. Um, and your property is valued on the carrying capacity. So um, I went back to the Nature Conservation Trust and said, well, let's find out what's there. Um, there's no point um, conserving something unless we know what it is that we're conserving. So they organised a, a bio blitz, um, which was seven scientists um, and ecologists, uh, 170 school children, uh, local volunteers and some Aboriginal uh, rangers. And we spent um, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday working out exactly what was on uh, the property and what was in the covenant and whether uh, it was worth um, uh, saving. And, and what we found was that, yes, it was, um, particularly around the bird life. And it, uh, it is the understory, um, you know, the acacias and wattles you probably could just see in that picture that is really, um, is disappearing under cropping and grazing. And this is where um, some of the most um, threatened and uh, critically endangered um, species uh, live. So first of all, um, to um, put the covenant on, uh, we had to fence off this area, um, uh, no barbed wire, and really to try and keep out predators, including kangaroos, um, which can be um, very, um, particularly during drought, they can really take over, but more particularly rabbits, foxes, um, and wild deer. We got carbon offsets for this country, um, which was nice and paid for the fencing and helped pay um, a few other things. But the most important uh, thing really for us uh, around the, um, the covenant was not the offsets, um, it was the value to our brand. And this um, has an added enormous value to our brand. It has also given us um, a market um, difference. So what's fantastic about um, the management plan we have um, with our covenant is that uh, we graze it uh, six months of the year. We graze it from um, March in autumn through to September. And um, we graze it with our cattle and the cattle provide ecosystem services. So it's rather like the cool burning regime that the Aborigines used to have, which um, we not, can no longer do, but the cattle provide um, with that grazing, they stop um, this country going back to forest. Now we've got plenty of forest um, locked up in national parks, but this is um, quite, quite different country. 
And this really led us on the journey of uh, grass fed only beef. And so um, we now produce only grass fed beef, which is um, no hormones, no antibiotics, uh, and no grains. And uh, we can supplement our cattle um, with silage. Um, but what's um, fantastic also uh, about grass fed only beef is um, it can, um, you know, have a carbon footprint, which is up to 95% smaller than um, feedlot uh, beef, which is fed on uh, corn and soy. And um, from um, an animal a husbandry perspective, which we're really strong on, um, it is so much, uh, so much better. Um, and we also um, do no live export. So we sell our beef um, under the Never Ever program and we get a premium for this beef and um, shoppers can go to butchers or the supermarket and have um, accredited grass fed over only beef. The accreditation process is quite stringent. You can be audited by outside auditors um, pretty much at any time. And it's around a 30 page audit, but um, we welcome that. With the onset of the covenant, we have also um, brought um, some, um, a couple of universities in to do scientific uh, research on the property, particularly in the covenant area. So uh, our new Sustainable Farms is doing research uh, on the property around bird life, but also some fantastic work around farm dams. So farm dams, which look like large, dirty uh, puddles, which are full of mud and um, animal excrement, are uh, um, uh, not great uh, for stock because um, you know the water is not clean. But they actually emit um, as much carbon and methane um, as a fleet of cars. So uh, who knew, really? <laughs> So uh, we're, we're part of uh, a, a program where we're beginning to um, fence off um, a number of our dams and plant around them and allow the reeds to grow in the dams, um, which um, provides, uh, cleans the water, reduces their emissions. But also once you have um, clean water, um, you, you can either fence them off totally and, and use a trough system, or you can provide one um, hopefully gravelled uh, entrance and exit into the uh, dam for, for stock. Um, but the, once the, the stock get cleaner water, they'll drink more water and they'll get uh, better weight gain. Um, and also planting around the dams can provide shelter um, also within the landscape. And Really, they're now providing um, um, uh, sort of water holes and, and, and refuge waterways um, for birds because we've drained a lot of our landscape. Our next stage, which really also came as a result of the covenant, uh, we were approached by ZQ Marino to um, have our wool um, fully, fully accredited. And it's accredited along the lines of animal husbandry, sustainability, and um, non-mulesing. So uh, there was a big push in Europe for non-mules wool. And um, mulesing is where you cut, cut the backside of the merino, maybe three uh, cuts um, either side um, uh, to stop the wrinkles in the backside. And that's where flies can get in. Um, lay eggs and you can end up with fly strike and um, it can be um, it can kill sheep so it's a practice that um, has been used um, uh, traditionally in Australia and um, we used to mules with pain relief but now we no longer mules and we crutch or shear the backside of the sheep um, uh, twice a year so we don't have to do that do this uh, what has been um, fantastic about joining ZQ Merino um, is that we're part of um, a, a wonderful group of farmers and brand partners um, around the world. 
So one of uh, uh, ZQ's big uh, brand partners is VF Corp. And VF Corp um, is a $6 billion turnover company. And uh, they own um, companies such as Icebreaker and North Face. So we're all values, purpose-driven uh, companies. Um, so when we sell our wool, the wool has to meet certain um, uh, standards around um, micron, around length, around color, around uh, tensile or strength. But once we meet those standards, this wool goes straight through at a 10 to 15% premium to ZQ. And we're not selling it um, on the open market, on the day, whatever the price may be, to um, potentially a random mill in China. And um, we don't know where that uh, wool is going. And um, it, we also know that we're selling it to brand partners with um, uh, open and accountable uh, supply chains uh, with no modern day slavery uh, in the manufacture. So uh, it was super exciting to have the wool procurement manager from BF Corp come and visit um, uh, the Covenant country and our farm in January. And um, just to really understand um, how we produce the wool and for us to understand, um, uh, you know, where it goes. And it's super exciting for me to be part uh, of a product and produce a product uh, which is not a fast fashion product. And as we all know, fast fashion is um, producing up to 10% of the world's um, carbon emissions. So for us, um, the, uh, the covenant has led us on a big journey and we've still got a way to go. We're uh, at the moment in the process of doing um, a carbon um, audit of the property, not including the covenant to see what our carbon footprint is. Um, the dream is uh, to sell carbon neutral wool. Um, not quite sure um, how that's going to go, but we'll, we'll uh, see how that um, unfolds. We are looking um, at uh, both um, biodiversity and carbon credits. Um, it's hard in Australia with carbon credits with our drought cycle. Um, so there's um, still a lot of work to be done there. But i um, very excited um, about the opportunity um, of biodiversity credits in the future. So, um, so it, there's an exciting future ahead. And um, this is only just the beginning of the journey. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. That's very inspiring uh, to hear how your, your brand value has increased uh, because of your covenant and how your because of that you're getting premium prices and uh, and you're delivering uh, selling to exclusive brands it's really interesting and good news now there are two questions i've noticed that the, both of them are connected to the covenants uh we in, in our mainland europe uh, i mean we're not familiar with covenants because the legal system here is very different thanks to napoleon and um i think it might be a good idea to take those two questions now so because uh um, so we have, first of all, Harem, uh, you, were, you wanted to know what, it, what is actually meant by covenant, so go ahead. So for us, the covenant, uh, we put a covenant on through uh, an organisation called the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, which is really a, a New South Wales, which is a state government body. And the state government um, has um, targets to put certain uh, landscapes um, under covenant. So this really means in perpetuity. So what it means is you can no longer uh, clear your land. You can't grow crops on your land. You can't harvest wood for profit on your land and you can't build um, buildings on your land. So it's really land um, for, for wildlife and landscape. Part of our covenant agreement is that we have to manage this um, landscape and we are audited normally once, or once every year or two by ecologists. And what we're really planning, what we have to do here is keep out feral animals, which um, I discussed earlier, 
but also introduced weeds such as blackberry, which is a weed in Australia, um, but um, St John's wort or other weeds. So it's really managing the landscape to try and keep it um, as healthy and pristine um, as possible. Yeah. And we also had a question about uh, about the covenant from Raymond. Uh, Raymond, uh, shall I ask it for you, or would you ask it? Uh, uh... Oh, yeah, she clarified more or less what the covenant is. I, I think that uh, I thought it was uh, the physical uh, structure, uh, like the the, yeah. the Hessas in Spain with the, with the, with the sparse uh, trees. But now I understand that it's a more of a, a legal construction, like a, a, not a commons, but. Uh, Swat in the middle of yeah yeah <laughs> that, that's correct <laughs> yeah yeah and and I think what what will be particularly interesting um, about our covenant um, although at the moment you know uh, in dollar terms it's the least valuable part of the property in 50 to 100 years time even in dollar terms um, it's going to be the most valuable part of the property because this sort of uh, untouched wilderness it was not untouched but this sort of country is becoming rarer and rarer so yeah good um so we'll now move to chris uh, chris uh floor is yours uh good morning everybody let me just uh try and share my screen with you So are you seeing that? Very good. Yep. Good. Mm. Uh, good morning, um, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk on this. Nature means business. We've we've heard two very different farm businesses from very different parts of the world. I'm going to try and see whether I can uh, tie the issues raised in the two previous presentations um, together uh, in. Uh, financial and business terms. Uh, and Anton introduced me as a, an economist. Um, I don't see myself as that. I see myself as a farmer, a businessman, and a quasi-economist who has had to learn about farm economics through the needs of my businesses and business, the businesses that, that I help. Um, I work with uh, um, a lot of farm businesses, and we've now are uh, heading into the plus 120 farm businesses and what I'm going to talk to you about today is reflected in every single one of these farm businesses. Every single one exhibits exactly the same characteristics and we've looked at arable, we've looked at lowland livestock, we've looked at mixed farms and we've looked at marginal upland farms as well. And the, the title of this of this morning is Nature Means Business and what I'm going to show you is that a productive approach to nature will create a viable farm business. And we're gonna do this uh, in, in mathematical and scientific and um, economic terms all in under 20 minutes. So we'll see how we get with that. So let's start with some really basic stuff. We have the sun. This is the energy in farming. And for some reason, we as an industry haven't looked at um, this free issue that the sun gives us. It is the source of all free issue energy. And when you understand that there is this free issue element, Martin raised it earlier in his presentation, this, 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 the, the, the asset we get for nothing, it comes originally from the sun. And so we have to understand that. And from that energy, we get food, the food in the form of grass or in the form of, of uh, cereals or vegetables or fruit. And that food is a form of energy, it's a fuel, a form of energy. When you go, I was on a farm uh, two days ago and I went onto that farm and picked up the grass and said, this is not grass, this is energy. And from that, everything uh, in scientific terms emanates. Um, when we're producing this energy, the energy we put into the production of that, we cannot get more out. So the production of fertilizer or feed 
or sprays, the energy that's gone into the manufacture of that, we cannot, as defined by the laws of science, get more energy out. The most cost effective way to run a farm business is using the free issue energy that we get from the sun. So there's the start. What have we found out? Let me start at the end. We have found that there is a sweet spot in farming. We've talked about the energy in farming. We're now moving on to the sweet spot in farming. And because of this free issue, the energy from the sun, when farming is at maximum profitability, nature is at its optimum value. And I'll explain why that is as we go through this. There is a sweet spot. And where farming and nature coincide, there is a sweet spot which, which is to their mutual benefit. Farming at maximum profitability, nature at optimum value. And understanding that drives everything in when you're making decisions uh, about a farm business and how to, how, how to manage that. We've done energy in farming, we've done the sweet spot in farming. There are five concepts in farming, the first of which we've already covered. Food is a fuel, it's a form of energy, and is subject to exactly the same laws of physics as oil or diesel or petrol or ethanol or methanol. Food is covered by exactly the same laws of physics. Second concept, nature demands a balance. It needs an equilibrium. And it doesn't matter what the land management is, it could be under covenanted, covenanted land in New South Wales, Australia, or on an arable farm in Cambridgeshire or anywhere in the world. It demands a balance, it demands an equilibrium. And if we don't have that equilibrium, there will always, always in every circumstance cause a stress on nature. Uh, and these are, are not um, arguable concepts, they are standard laws of physics. The maximum sustainable output, which is what we're going to go on to in a minute, which that Anton introduced earlier, is the point of equilibrium between farming and nature. Getting to that sweet spot, to that MSO, MSO point, is where every farm should be trying to aspire to get to. If you farm beyond the MSO, if you try and drive yields, and looking at Martin's forefathers, they tried to drive yield, not because uh, they were wrong to do so, uh, because they were led down that route. That was what the demand of society and governments was. But it, so if you go beyond MSO, maximum sustainable output, or if you farm below it, you will not avoid stress on nature. MSO in a managed landscape is the only place to, to be. And if you go beyond or are below MSO, the outcomes will defy prediction. And that is because nature only acts in a random way. You can't go back, it is irreversible. If something is random, very, very difficult, impossible to go back. So we've got the five concepts, we've had the sweet spot, we've had the energy in farming. Let's have a look at the landscape created by farming. And as, all, as I've already alluded to, farming works within a managed landscape. Claire was talking about the landscape and uh, this covenanted farm and where you have to manage it. And, and that is what you have to do in a managed landscape. You can't really leave it to do nothing because it's been nudged along for 1500 years. And that nudging, that moving forward was to produce food and to increase the productivity. But, and it's a big but, more recently as an industry, the agricultural industry, we've been forced uh, along to deliver outputs at all costs. And in fact, many might say that it's output at any cost. And both Claire and Martin uh, referred to that type of approach. The, the landscape in which we farm and which is managed should only occupy a place of equilibrium. That place is the maximum sustainable output, MSO. 
But this, this point is technically, in science terms, it's a point of unstable equilibrium. It is unstable because it has to be managed. It is, you'd require good husbandry for crops or livestock. Without that, you, have a, you, you can't maintain that equilibrium, that equilibrium at MSO. So we've looked at the landscape, the energy, the, the uh, five concepts. Where do we go next? Well, let's concentrate a bit further on the free issue in farming. And the free issue, which, we, which comes from the sun, gives us several things. It gives us sunshine, it gives us rain, it gives fertility, grass, crops, vegetables, fruit, whatever it is. So we get that for nothing. And as I said earlier, that changes the whole economics of farming. Why does it do that? Well, we have been taught and told and led down the route with an obvious and convenient model. Now, um, bear with me. So we have revenue and costs up the vertical axis, and we have output volumes on the horizontal axis. There's a revenue line. As you increase the amount you sell, whether it's cereals or uh, merino sheep or whatever it is, as you increase the output, your revenue increases. You have a level of fixed costs, the costs that don't change even with, uh, as, as you increase your, your output. And you have your variable costs that do change as you increase your output because they are associated with volume, feed, fertilizer, sprays, vet and med, that sort of thing. And what we've been told is that there's a break even point. And that break even point occurs where the variable cost line crosses the revenue line. And it, it, this model has been standard practice. The standard theory of the firm has been looked at, uh, has been used by all industries, bull bearings, cars, anything, um, cheese, food, whatever it is, this is the model. And as you drive, drive production, you make more money because the profits increase, or well, that is what's supposed to happen. So in summary, if you expand beyond the break-even point, you get continually growing profits. And as you uh, increase your output, so the, your fixed cost recovery burden de de decreases. But what is actually happening in farming? No one was more surprised than me to find out that when uh, we were farming, as we reduced our, 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 the number of sheep and beef we had, suddenly, our losses went, uh, went down and our profits began to appear. And when we started working with our other farms, we began to find exactly the same thing. And I want to explain to you why this actually works and why the standard theory of the firm doesn't work. So we've got the same chart and we've got the same lines apart from the variable cost line, which I've hatched and shaded. And that is because in farming, that happens. So what we have, if I can get my pen going, we have from here to here, costs associated with the free issue, the naturally available energy coming from the sun in the form of fertil uh, natural fertility, natural rain, et cetera, et cetera, natural grass growth, okay? That is what we have called PVCs, productive variable costs. Now we don't have to get into the, into the nomenclature uh, in too much detail, but the principle is that there are variable costs associated with the free issue. As you drive your production and you go from the inflection point here to your volume output up here, you start using uh, additional costs to counteract for the disadvantages on your farm. They are corrective. You're trying to correct the disadvantages using fertilizer, feed, et cetera, et cetera, vet and med, purchase food. And so as you drive production and you go away from the free issue, you're suddenly finding that actually your production goes up, but your uh, viability, your profitability goes down. And we have this real problem in agriculture that we haven't understood this. Most of the farms that I work with are in this area here, if 
I can go and make it work somewhere in here. So they've been through the profitable point here, driven their production, and they're, they're now in loss making uh, in a loss making area. Now this uh, for uh, UK and Europe is before support. When we do a farm review, we want to understand where the farm business is before support. And so we have this real problem that the most profitable point in a farm business is at that inflection point, with, which is the, the, the sweet spot in any farm business. And you need farm businesses to move back to that maximum sustainable output point to be as profitable and as working with nature rather than substituting for it. So in farming, variable costs are non-linear, non-linear. They are comprised of two parts, the PVCs working with nature, the CVCs incurred when substituting for nature. And so profits are maximized at this point here, uh, and this is the MSO. So where do we go from here? Well, I've got one more chart to show you, bear with me. This is uh, a very similar chart to the one I've just, I've just shown you, just simplified it a little bit. This is the profiles of profits in farming. And what we're looking at here is the MSO point here on, on, uh, at the top of the mountain chart. As you increase your, your volumes, your profits go up. Uh, once you get over beyond MSO, your profits decrease. But how does, it, how does this affect the, the, the equilibrium, the balance? So you need to be at MSO, this point up here, to be at the point where you are most in balance with nature in a managed landscape. If you go beyond it, your profits drop and nature is disadvantaged in a serious way. If you are below MSO, if you want to um, tackle a particular type of habitat or a typical, a typical, uh, a typical uh, a, a type of environment, then you need to come back down on the left-hand side of this chart, but understand that the energy required to maintain that environment is going to be greater than the energy um, up at MSO. So, the concept of, it, of MSO, the maximum sustainable output, in every farm business, whether it's Claire's or Martin's or anybody else's, there will be a unique one-off MSO point. And this point occurs um, where the allocation of crops or livestock to the environment or habitat is optimized for yields and animal welfare realities. So that sweet spot, that mutual benefit between nature and farming. The MSO point, your economic yields are maximized. Putting fertilizer on or sprays causes a downturn in productivity and a downturn in nature. Conservation costs are, are minimized. You can maximize the impact of the natural energy or the sun, that free issue we were talking about, and minimize the in industrial energy that goes into farming really, really important to understand that free issue is what it says it is, free issue. Whereas the industrial energy that you buy in does not come free. Uh, the prevailing habitat, the environment on that farm is optimized to deliver the greatest economic value. And in a managed landscape and um, where we're producing food, that is really, really important. It eliminates the adulteration of nature. A couple more slides. Um, consequently, uh, it will be found at MSO that natural capital will be maximized. And whether you define natural capital as biodiversity or soil carbon, you will maximize the natural capital at the MSO points. Um, environmental stress will be also minimized. We go onto farms and put a, do a, a, what we call an ESI, an environmental stress index, and we can show now with all the farms that we've looked at that the ESI, the environmental stress index, is at its best at MSO. Nationally, for policymakers, we optimize agricultural output 
And not only that, the profitability of farms is maximized as well. And to at least some extent, it reduces the, the burden on policy, on governments to support farming where, uh, in a way that has not worked over the past 60, 70 or 80 years. Last slide. We need to treat nature as a stakeholder in a farm business. And when you have a stakeholder in any business, that stakeholder, that shareholder expects a dividend. Nature gives you this free issue for nothing and doesn't expect a dividend. What it does expect is that you look after it, that you put your arm around its shoulder, you, look, you, you, you treat it in an appropriate way. There is no burden on the farm profits when you treat nature as a stakeholder. It provides benefits such as natural fertility and natural grass. When you treat nature as a stakeholder and you don't adulterate nature, it will, it, when you adulterate nature, it reduces farm profitability, uh, farm, farm profitability and productivity. And finally, a productive nature creates a viable farm business. And that's where we should be persuading policymakers and farmers to head towards. Thank you very much.